Hello, everyone. Thank you for sticking around early in the mor morning on the first day of the conference. So we'll get started. Uh, I'll be up here for a while. I have a back-to-back double-header talk, so make it interactive. If you want to ask a question, we don't have to wait till the end. Raise your hand. I'll stop. We'll talk about it. Yep, that better. There you go. If you have a question during the talk, let's make it interactive um, so we go through it. Uh, the first talk will be in curation we trust, which we've given a couple times uh, from Inviso. We keep updating it as we change some things uh, inside our own network and new features come out with MISP like uh, the workflows, etc. So um, there will be some changes to that uh, presentation and then we'll go into uh, a talk that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, around how to visualize data in systems like MISP, but outside of MISP where other business units can use it and see it and correlate it with other data sources. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I joined the Army when I was 17. Uh, while I was in the Army, got my master's degree in computer science. Um, since then, um, I've moved to Belgium to start work for Inviso, been there for about 17 months, um, enjoying it immensely and uh, heading up the threat intelligence program there. Some interesting facts about me, I was a Bradley Fighting Vehicle Systems Maintainer uh, in the military, which is not the normal thing you usually hear about the military transitioning to cyber. It's usually threat intel or uh, communications, but I was a mechanic um, basically for tanks. And that led into being a certified uh, mechanic for automotive vehicles, especially um, classic cars is my passion. And then, of course, I'm a gamer. Um, and then uh, I actually owned my own IT business for a bit, but uh, that was too much to handle on my own. So, uh, in short, I used to work on these, which uh, led to me loving to work on these. Um, Actually won a championship in Halo while in the Army. Studied a lot of uh, books to get my master's degree. And then this is what my family thinks I do. So so let's get into the content. So the first thing we'll talk about with the um, curation talk is around why it's a problem. Everybody knows curation is a problem, especially if you're going to start sending data to a SOC. Automation is key. Everybody's trying to make... Uh, everything as fast and quick as possible. With that comes the risk of false positives. And you, the threat intelligence uh, team doesn't want to get a reputation of all they send us is junk. So we've got to do something to fight that. So we came up with our way of doing it. That works pretty well for us, and I hope that it uh, works well for you all as well. And then we'll go over some of the lessons learned and things that we're going to do in the future. And then we'll have Q&A, uh, but like I said, if you have questions during the talk, let's just uh, make it as interactive as possible. So, um, this is just a short um, overview of what we'll talk about in the Power BI talk after the curation talk. So, the problem, the proposed solution, how to make the MISP database accessible, which may be a no-brainer for some people, but if you're not um, a SQL, uh, guy, um, then it might be interesting in that aspect. Then how we can create visuals using a business intelligence tool like Power BI. And then Q&A, um, and then after this talk today, there's going to be a very detailed blog posted um, about how to do this step by step. Um, don't have the time to go through the entire thing, um, but uh, you'll be able to read that on the blog. So what's the problem? Um, the problem being that everybody wants to share threat intelligence. They want to help. Um, and in that effort, sometimes garbage gets shared. So, and the threat intelligence team wants to get all the information they can. They don't want to miss out on anything. So they pull in the garbage. So then you get enriched garbage because we like to run enrichments virus total we like to see where the dns is we add tags to it and then 
we try to correlate it with other things. So now you have a big pile of correlated garbage. And then it gets shipped to your sock. And if you have sightings or if you have alerts configured for that, you're going to get sightings on your garbage. And then it's just an ever-increasing balloon of garbage. So we need to do something about that. Who's seen this indicator in their sim before? Yeah, everybody, right? It's probably in there right now. Hopefully it's deactivated. Hopefully there's a whitelist. Uh, but everybody does this. And this technically is not a bad indicator. It's bad if it's set to be alerted on. But it could be contextual. The malware reaches out to a.a.ed to check internet connectivity. But it doesn't need to go to the SOC. But it has the IDS flag enabled in MISP. So that's what a lot of organizations, including our organization, use when we do API calls to MISP to pull out indicators to push into XOR or Sentinel or uh, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, all different products. They're going to look for that IDS flag enabled. And then all hell breaks loose. The SOC has 200 alerts. They're calling you um, a lot of bad names. And then you're having to explain why did you let 8.8.8.8 through? Isn't it obvious that that is not a malicious indicator? So that goes back into the inflating garbage scenario. So at Inviso, we have three main teams that... Um, also produce as well as ingest threat intelligence. So our MDR service is our managed service provider for SOC-related activities. They produce intelligence from alerts, um, but they also consume it from us for their detections. And we also help with generating use cases for detection engineering and threat hunting. And then for the C-cert, for incident response, forensics, uh, malware reversing, we use a lot of this information as well um, for those activities. And we generate threat intelligence from our IR cases or our malware analysis. And then, of course, the CTI team, we produce intelligence, we ingest intelligence. We need this intelligence to do all of these use cases here listed on the slide. Whether we're making a, uh, we're doing a Tiber assessment, so we're trying to look at critical functions and we're looking at uh, threat actors that would uh, attack those critical functions, or we're doing threat landscape reports, or building threat hunt use cases. We need good intelligence. This, I'm sure I don't have to tell you what MISP is, but uh, this is what we use uh, in our organization, of course, um, and we call it our MISP ecosystem. We have a, a set of MISPs that have dedicated purposes. So our architecture. As the intel comes in, whether it's from um, first or it's from an RSS uh, feed or commercial feed, it goes into our edge MISP or what we call our inbound MISP. And from our inbound MISP, once there's a process for curation, it gets shipped over to our central MISP. The central MISP is the source of truth. There should be nothing um, that you wouldn't trust in the central MISP. The central MISP feeds the CERT or the incident response MISP, and it also feeds the MDR or SOC MISP. That way, uh, in the IR MISP is all the indicators from IR cases that are TLP red. So we decided we wanted our, a separate MISP instance for those cases due to their sensitivity. And then if the client does say, yes, I'm willing to share it, TLP amber, TLP amber strict, um, not attributed to me, then we can change it and push it into the central MISP. Otherwise, it stays in the IR MISP and can only be used for other IR cases. Uh, the SOC MISP, that's where we push all information that has been vetted and can then be pulled into all the security devices, both at Inviso and our clients. And then the SOC can also push Intel into their MISP for future correlation. So you have some problems, right? So you have potential false positives. Everybody uses warning lists. Uh, 
So we, we do use warning lists to help uh, do curation in both an automated and a manual process. And then you also have lack of contextualization. So you have events that have no context, no tagging, um, no galaxies, no anything. A uh, phishing email with 100 IP addresses. A phishing event, 100 IP addresses. Who knows what those IP addresses are, et cetera. And then you have inconsistencies with tagging. So people aren't using the taxonomies. They're building their own taxonomies, making custom tags. We have to do something about that because we're a very automated shop. With automation, the data coming into the automation needs to be the same or the automation won't work. And then is the event actually actionable? Is an event with 86,000 attributes and hardly any context usable for your use case? So our curation process is a basically a funnel. The large amount of events come in the top. Uh, we try to remove as many false positives as possible. Add contextualization, so mandatory tagging um, that we set um, that has to be uh, involved in every event that's going to be pushed to the SOC. And then we try to add sources, uh, other tags as we can, given the information provided. And then we have to just make the last check to make sure, is this something that I would want to research in the SOC if it alerted? So this is our attempt to solve the problem. So on the automation side, we wrote some scripts that would catch the information coming in using ZMQ, unpublish it, change tags back to the way they should be, um, match it against uh, the source to tag the source that it actually came from, the creator org, um, and then do some other automation that I'll get into in a minute. So. In our automated process, ZMQ, we have a ZMQ script that subscribes to the information coming in to the um, Edge MISP, and it sets it to unpublished. And then it sets an incomplete workflow tag. So that's something the TI analyst can look at and know that this is the events that I need to curate today. It also sets the source uh, using a custom taxonomy. So Inviso source sets a local tag saying this came from cert by earn, uh, this came from XYZ, et cetera. And then we sanitize, make sure all the tags are the correct, correct format. Um, and we are going to add something that uh, modifies things to TLP 2.0 because it is a reality, unfortunately. <laughs> No more said about that. So, <laughs> um, so with the MISP warning list, we've created a set of warning lists that are custom to our organization. And these are owned by the MDR service. So they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones that see the false positives firsthand. They populate our Nitro warning list. All our other MISPs, so I said the central MISP was the source of truth. Well, the, sorry, I keep dropping this microphone. Um, the SOC MISP is the source of truth for the Nitro warning list. And then we have a script that pulls that warning list and duplicates it on all our other MISPs. So that when we go through the, so if we do fail, if an indicator gets through, a false positive is created, it doesn't happen again. We'll only fail once on that indicator. So, once all that automation takes place, we have a list of cura uh, partially curated events that the analyst still needs to look at. There's always a human factor. So every morning, the analyst comes in and looks for unpublished events that have that workflow in complete tag. And then manually review warning lists to see if there's any matches. Sometimes you'll have a warning list hit on like the top 10 uh, top 10,000 or whatever, but it's triggering on the domain, but it's a full URL, so that's okay. Uh, we want them to know about a full URL with a payload sitting in OneDrive, but it is going to hit that uh, warning list for OneDrive being a very popular site. And of course, you know that you can filter by the warning list um, so that you're only looking at a subset of the data in the event. And then we make sure the event has... Uh, 
the next necessary context that it needs, and we add that as much as we can with miter tagging, Malpedia, uh, the tie cert, um, uh, threat actor cards, uh, tool cards, etc. And then we add, make sure that the target info is correct um, for how it should alert in the SOC. So if you have a list of IPs, was this a C2 IP? Was this the source IP for the email server? Um, was this a compromised account, or believed to be a compromised account? Was this actually um, threat actor infrastructure, et cetera? As much as we can. So just an example of adding those tags there. And then the last check before we hit the publish tag is that mental check. If something happens and this gets alerted on, is there enough information here for the analyst to make a good decision about what is the next step to take? And then we hit the uh, workflow state complete tag. And then there is a job that uh, pushes or pulls these events from uh, this from the edge miss to the central miss. There you go. Yep. Might need more than one microphone. <laughs> oh, you got it. Get your sport on. Uh, thank you. I have a question regarding the curation because you mentioned that actually you consume, you unpublish all the events and afterwards you do manual curation uh, on it. Uh, do you prioritize the curation, the manual curation? Uh, because you could have a queue that is really big and you need in a certain way to, to do in a certain way uh, a prioritization between the events to be curated, manually curated first. Thank yes. you. So, Especially after you say a bunch of your teammates and yourself are on vacation, you haven't curated data in a week, you come back from vacation, there's a thousand events to be curated. A lot of stuff. So we do try to prioritize, but it's not a um, automated function at this point. It's more analyst knowledge. So we know the source because we tag the sources, even though um, you could search on the creator org, et cetera. The tagging is really helpful for what the where the event came from. Uh, and we also look, so we look at the, the sources of data that we know generate good intel that's actionable. We know who, who's, who's good, who's bad, who's mediocre, et cetera. Um, and then we also look for Types of events that we know would be valuable to our clients. So phishing, yeah, by the time you get the phishing intel in, the site's usually dead. Um, it's valuable, but not as much as, say, a uh, ransomware event, et cetera, where there's actually the, mal the malware is still active, uh, the dropper is still active, et cetera. Um, and we also look for events that have a lower number of attributes, um, a mid range. So I do sort on the number of attributes and work from the ones with the lowest amount of attributes up. Cause usually, usually, when you get a MISP event in from a community that shares a lot of MISP events, the ones with lower number of attributes historically are the better ones because there's been time taken to weed out the stuff already. If you get an event with 100 attributes in it, more than li likely they just copied it from the case or the blog post and pasted it in, and I shared something today. So that's how we prioritize. Um, yep. Hi. Uh, there was a uh, point on the curation uh, process um, about quality and completeness, and... What means quality for you and how do you guarantee or assess the quality? It is, it is, um, a gut check. Um, so when we hire TI analysts, um, most of our TI analysts have, um, uh, to this point so far have experience doing SOC work. They have experience doing forensics. Everybody on our team um, 
kind of the same as the military. You're an infantryman first, and everything else is secondary. So we're all incident responders and forensic analysts first. Um, if a case pops where we need people, everybody on the C-cert is capable of doing forensics and incident response. Some of us have additional duties and experience and skills doing threat intelligence. Um, that will change as we grow, of course, so while we will have to adapt when we get junior profiles in that may not know that um, just off the top of their head. Um, but to this point, it's, it's a gut check. Um, putting yourself in the analyst seat, saying that if a detection engineer created a one-for-one -one rule where if this IP fires on a firewall on the edge network, would I have enough information to actually do something about it? You may not have enough information on that one IP, and maybe this is another talk we can get into next time, um, but we do a lot of integrations with XOR, Palo Alto's XOR. Um, so in our case, you don't get just the IP address when something fires. In, uh, you do in the client environment, in Sentinel and whatever, you get threat intelligence event. But it comes into XOR. XOR searches our MISP instance and pulls all the information about every event that has that IP or hash or whatever, pulls the comments for all the attributes, pulls the tags for all the attributes, and populates that inside of the case that the analyst is working. So he doesn't get, or he or she uh, doesn't get just an IP address that's threat intelligence alert. They get everything. So as long as we've tagged it, we, um, and you can pull the additional context, um, then I believe they would have enough. But yeah, it's a, it's a good, so long explanation, but it, it was required to, sh to show the extra steps that are involved. So, we do have a five strikes and you're out rule um, for sharing organizations. If you give us five really bad events, and really bad, like they are garbage, um, just complete garbage, you've automated something and you're just pulling everything out of your sandbox and dumping it into MISP and sharing it with the world, you're going to get five strikes pretty quick. Um, we don't track those five strikes in MISP. Um, maybe that's something we could uh, think about later, but we do we do it in Obsidian, if anybody's used Obsidian. We do a lot with Obsidian now, so uh, most of our threat intelligence teamwork uh, knowledge base is in Obsidian. Um, so we track uh, those organizations uh, and how many times they've got a strike. Uh, when they hit five strikes, they go into the, the organization block list. Um, that way we don't have to worry about getting events from them anymore. Um, and you may say, oh, aren't you worried about missing intelligence? Uh, we'll get into some statistics later, um, but no. Uh, there's tons of intelligence. The little bit that I'm going to miss from Joe's sandbox is not uh, going to hurt me. Um, but we also want to make sure that if for some reason one of our other MISPs has uh, an event come in from that org, um, we synchronize the block list across all our ecosystem. So we try to make sure our MISPs are synced. Warning lists, block lists, deleted events, uh, all that. So, And that's what the uh, sample of the script there that uh, does that synchronization across our um, ecosystem uh, of MISPs so that they're all the same. So, talked about statistics. You can see here, and I'll go forward so you get all the boxes. Um, this is our inbound MISP as of 11.30 last night. Uh, updated the slides. Um, and if you saw the talk in first uh, or BrewCon, these numbers are different. So, And they're lower, which is weird. So the number of events is higher, but the number of attributes is lower. And you may ask why that is. Well, we're constantly doing cleanup. So we're deleting things that don't matter, doesn't matter. Or um, 
we've decided that an organization has been sharing too much bad information, so we purge them and all their intelligence from our system. So the number may go down. Um, but as you can see, and I'll try to get my little laser, virtual laser pointer here. For the number of organizations that have shared intelligence, and this may be through sharing organizations uh, where you get one-off events from one person that decided to share that day. Um, 613 unique organizations have shared information with us. Uh, this is a right at two years um, now. Um, and out of that, we've block listed 17 organizations, which is only, as you see right there, um, 2.7%. So that goes back to the, am I worried about missing out on intelligence? Uh, no. Uh, we're getting plenty of intel, and the, the ratio to what we're blocking, uh, giving that five-strike rule, is very, very low. And this uh, statistics dashboard was made um, using the MISP uh, dashboarding feature, uh, if you've used that much, with some custom widgets. Um, created by Kuhn Van Imp. Uh, you in here, Kuhn? Nope. Well, oh, he'll be talking uh, later. Today and tomorrow, I believe. So, what are some other things that we do that's not quite... Uh, well, some of it's part of the curation process and some of it is uh, for uh, ad hoc needs. So for false positives, uh, we created a script that checks all hashes of unpublished events in the inbound MISP every day before um, curation. Uh, and it currently uses the circle hash lookup service. So if you use the circle hash lookup service, you get back some information on the hash um, from various sources, one of them being the NSRL, um, and there will be a JSON key value pair that tells you that it's NSRL legacy. That is what we flag on. Um, if the hash is in the NSRL legacy, uh, it adds a tag, uh, circle NSRL, to the attribute and removes the IDS flag. Now it is possible that something in the NSRL could be used maliciously or not uh, for that environment, et cetera. So that's just an indicator for the curation analyst, the person doing curation, to look at those and validate that that is something. It has saved us from a lot of false positives. People put in things that are guilty by association, low baz commands, all types of stuff, um, and that saves us a lot. We sync our warning lists, as I said earlier, so there's a separate script that pulls the warning lists from the SOC MISP and populates them across all our other MISPs. And then we do deactivate indicators after a certain uh, period of time, and this is in uh, concert with our MISP, uh, our uh, SOC services. So we have monthly meetings with the MDR services where we talk about things, and we do adjust uh, things on the fly. Um, but we set time limits for URLs, domains, uh, host names, IPs, et cetera. Uh, and it turns the IDS flag off at a certain date of publish, um, publish date. And then if it's ever seen again, the clock starts over again. Um, of course, you probably all know about the decaying models in MISP. We have not started to use those yet due to the way you need to set up uh, what tags it's looking at to set the uh, indicator values, um, but we will be looking at that uh, at a later state. We do collect OSINT, so we pull in blogs um, and we pull in RSS feeds mainly using um, the MISP scraper now, created by Kun Van Impa, um, which he'll be talking about uh, tomorrow, I believe. Um, but we use that um, to pull in events into the inbound MISP, uh, which are then, uh, you, uh, the, the scraper uses the HTML to markdown functionality in, in MISP to generate event reports, uh, in, uh, create an event, generate an event report, automatically tag the event uh, using keyword matching, et cetera, and then parsing out the attributes. 
These need the most curation because it is, it's machine reading, uh, keyword matching. There will be things that it pulls that you don't want, but the event's already 60% created for you. At least you're not missing out on that blog. You're not missing out on that RSS feed. It's in there. It just needs to be curated. Um, appropriate tags applied, et cetera, or removed. And then we have a script to bulk delete events. So if for some reason a hash or a bad uh, indicator gets in or we want to purge uh, um, an organization or a commercial feed because we no longer have the license, so technically we can't use their intelligence anymore, we have a script that you know can bulk delete across all our MISP instances uh, based on org ID, have, attribute, um, et cetera, any, any uh Thing you can search with PyMIS, basically. So uh, usually I go into workflows here, but uh, Sammy will be doing that later. Uh, so I'll let you handle that one. But uh, some of the workflows uh, f functionality, we do plan on removing um, the ZMQ script that does uh, like the unpublishing and possibly using the workflow to do that as well. So I won't get into playing that video. So we'll skip on to lessons learned. So tooling, um, automate as much as you possibly can, but make sure it's custom to your use case and your environment. Don't just find the, the latest blog that looks cool or the latest GitHub repo, and you try to repurpose it without modifying it for your use case. Make sure you understand what the automation is trying to do um, and make sure it does what you want it to do. Uh, in your use case. And then you also want to make sure you extend what you already have. Don't go buy another tool or another shiny object. A lot of the things we already have in-house have the functionality you need. You just haven't explored that option. So make sure you're looking at what you already have. And then the worst, um, for me anyway, is documentation. So we all like to build stuff. We all like to... Uh, create events. We like to do malware reversing, etc. I hate documentation with a passion, uh, but it's necessary. So if you're not there anymore, if you're on vacation, you've moved on and you've created this awesome ecosystem with all these scripts, but there's no documentation on how it works. They don't know the directories the scripts live in. They don't know what the cron jobs do. You have to document all that, and it's easier to do it if you do it while you go than trying to go back and do it after the fact. And then communicate with your stakeholders uh, and do it at the appropriate time um, when you know that you and the stakeholder will be ready. So you do need to do your primary intelligence requirements gatherings, of course, up front, uh, for what you want the program to do, but then pull in your consumers and your stakeholders when you have something or a process to generate um, something that they may require and you understand the business and you understand why it would be helpful so that you can speak to it. Um, sometimes the business doesn't know what they need or what they could do. They don't know what threat intelligence is or can do or can help them. So when you go and you try to interview a certain department for like the business information security office, the Bezos, um, they want to make sure their segment of the business doesn't click on phishing emails. How can threat and tell help with that? Um, so sometimes you have to explain it to them and then they're like, yes, that's what I want. I want that right there. So just make sure you're talking to people and then also make sure that there's a requirement that if you consume intelligence from me, from the TI team, it is a requirement that you give me feedback. There has to be a feedback loop. I need to know if this was helpful. I need to know if it was a false positive. Uh, and that needs to be incorporated into your threat intelligence lifecycle. And then, of course, you go through the whole cycle all over again. Feature state. We're going to integrate the MIST workflow features. <clears throat> we're playing around with it now, and we're going to share blueprints as we create them um, for the rest of the community to use. Um, 
And we're also going to try to help uh, create new modules or, new, or functionality within the currently existing modules. Um, haven't had a lot of time yet, but uh, do want to do things like that. Like, uh, and I opened some issues for like local tagging, that sort of thing. But we hope to be able to contribute to that section of the project. Um, and then contribute back to the community. So f f in the past two years, and I've only been there 17 months or so, um, it's been focused on the internal uh, operations, the MDR service. We need to, uh, now that we're in a pretty stable set, uh, we need to start sharing back with the community. And as you could tell by our use case, it... Um, we change events that are not ours, which is something that's against the mist sharing model, right? You're not supposed to change an event that's not yours. You're supposed to propose things to it. You can add local tags to it so that the community learns and adapts and the event grows over time. Um, so we need to add a community MISP to our ecosystem, and that will be the MISP that we don't touch the events. We don't change the events. We propose that the IDS flag is turned off. We propose that you should add um, this tagging or that tagging, et cetera. And then that gets synchronized back with our sharing communities. And then announcements. We had planned on building like a Slack bot for MISP events, but we're going to use workflows for that now because it has webhooks, et cetera, which will be talked about later. And then, of course, we're going to open source our scripts. Um, right now, they're very tailored to our environment, which you probably heard in the other talks if you attended them or watched them online. We are in a process of cleaning them up, adding arguments so you can use it better on the command line. Some of it's static, um, so static um, naming conventions, etc. We're going to change that so that it has arguments so that you could put it into a cron job and use it uh, in your environment or adapt it as you see fit. Promise it'll be out before Christmas. So, and that's the end of the first section of my my talk. Yes. Um, I have a question about the um, uh, taxonomies. Yes. Um, a few years ago, I read a study about threat sharing platforms and the challenges about uh, talking about the same thing. What is a category for one is something different for the other. And I was thinking about all the third organizations in Europe. And if you, ENISA is also into the game of getting those taxonomies aligned. Mm -hmm. And that was a few years ago, I read different studies and I was thinking about, hey, where are we now? Still all over the place. <laughs> we, okay. I mean, it's, it, it almost goes back to the whole sticks miss discussion, right? So everybody has their own way of doing things. They want to call it this. We want to call it that, et cetera. So you have to define what taxonomies you're going to use, and that should be defined at the framework level of your CTI program. So when you establish the guidelines for your CTI program, you should have a glossary and a, a lexicon these are the things we're going to use. Uh, over time, like you're going to use estimated language, you're going to probability yardstick, you're going to use uh, admiralty codes, you're going to use TLP 1.0, 2.0, et cetera, but that's what we're going to use. Um, we're not going to deviate from that as an organization. That way it stays the same over time. As you mature, then you may be able to create a matrix that would relate to this taxonomy to this one and it matches um, somewhat and you can do that translation uh, on your own in, in your environment. But you can't change other people's events so that's part of the reason why we have this use case where we modify the tags to make sure that they're in our taxonomy. So, hope that helps. So, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing. About the feedback loop with the customer environments, can you share a few tips to make successful use of the sightings, uh, the false positive sightings, and how you scale it technically to, to rate the feeds and so on? Yep. So um, sightings right now um, are in the infancy 
Um, because we do, depending on where we get the siding from, um, it has to be contractually, um, okay with the client that we gather that information, even if it's so removed that it's just, yes, I saw this IP address. We still have to get a, yep, I'm okay with that from the client. Um, so right now we do that with XOR. Um, there's a process that creates a siding. Um, but it can also create a MISP event when the analyst closes the event in SOC and the XOR product. Then they can tag attributes with a MISP share tag in XOR. And then that playbook will push the event and the sightings into MISP. But we are looking at standing up a sightings uh, database, um, the, uh, another project um, by Circle, um, where we can push them in faster um, from direct. So, <laughs> Going back to when I was in the States and I worked at a financial institution, certain devices we trusted more than others, and we pushed sightings directly from the security tool uh, using that tool's API. Uh, and we pushed a, glo a global sighting for that tool. So the only tool we pushed sightings from in that environment was FireEye um, because we were very confident that the FireEye events were 99.9% .9 accurate. Uh, and then that made a positive sighting, and it listed the source as FireEye NX, FireEye EX, etc. So. Hi. Uh, could you discuss a little bit why you use the current architecture that you're using instead of just using the edge MISP and filtering certain events out of that? The, I guess, how you grew your infrastructure to use the the central one as well. So this um, project was started before I got to Inviso, so part of it was already built in this infrastructure. So I did have some of those same questions when I joined, but it just keeps it extremely clean having separate instances. Um, we're able to push and pull based on tag filtering, org filtering, uh, et cetera. Um, we could get into the whole thing about using sharing groups, and which we do use sharing groups on the SOC MISP. So, um, and I can go into that uh, off because <laughs> I'm running out of time, but we can go into the sharing groups, but it's based on sectors of the client, and if the client's in the same sector as another client, then they get the same indicators, et cetera. Um, but it was just cleaner, especially from a maintenance point of view, so we knew we could update this one out of band from this one, et cetera. And they're also in different network segments as well. The edge mist uh, sits in the DMZ, the uh, central mist sits in our protected um, CSERT network, which uh, doesn't allow inbound internet connections. It can only go outbound. That's why it's a push pull from the central mist, things like that. Okay. Great. If there's no more questions, we can go to the next one. Thank you.